field around it is certainly not a uniform one. Uh, Goldshare would be mapping that very accurately by having a free mass, uh, say, located in a gradiometer. Sorry, let me go back. Uh, in a gradiometer, uh, where the fact the gradiometer is um, um, the electric has the electric properties in terms of a capacitor, and there is a free mass, so the satellite is trying to follow a free mass uh, orbiting the Earth. Some of the aspects there is, apart from the intricacies, the higher accurate, uh, say, requirements in designing such uh, um, an instrument. Uh, one has to go through a verification that during launch, uh, the excitation generated by the launcher, the, the, the effect on the instrument that one would have an instrument functioning after launch. And some of the difficulties we had is that some minute particles were generated during vibration, say through the appropriate vibration level. It took some effort to try and really to, to solve some of those problems. So again, the things we have to, to, to address in space is not that the materials, the design, but also as you go through the verification elements which are generated through the process. Um, th this is an interesting uh, aspect, uh, take a moment on that. The, uh, a very high ambitious, uh, say, uh, the mission uh, the European Space Agency embarked is the Herschel Telescope. Uh, there's going to be a, a lot of breaks and uh, say breakthrough scientific uh, domain. And um, this is in the barrier of what you can achieve with respect to optical verifications and tackling it through uh, the wave type, uh, electromagnetic type of verifications. So the people, after uh, you're talking a satellite of the order of 600 million. Uh, this specific one and its sister, uh, the Planck, uh, also of about the equivalent level. Now, when, when people uh, tried to have a system test, uh, they were quite disappointed in that there was a mismatch in the focal uh, uh, plane uh, with about 10 millimeters. And uh, people, of course, immediately thought, well, uh, somebody uh, messed up, perhaps the analysis, uh, finite element is not, sometimes not so uh, uh, clear you could try and have a, a rigid motion as a mechanism type rather than a, a proper elastic deformation. So people went back, but they could not find anything. So they, they started experimenting more, understanding more. Just to put the thing short, uh, what was happening is that the material of, uh, say, uh, the coefficient of thermal expansion, if one was not taking care of, it, of the difference between uh, room temperature, uh, uh, minus 10, minus 20, down to minus 70. If that information was not accurate, there was no uh, way one would get information. So as people uh, then uh, perform verification, both from the optic side and from the electrodynamic side, verifying that uh, the parameter was correct, and more information was coming in on information of the coefficient of thermal expansion, we finally got numbers which were matching. And I think what is very important to note here is that the uh, work which was done was correct first time round, with just the CT information at, uh, say, uh, 70K it was not accurate. So, uh, and then it's not something you pick up a, a, a handbook and you're trying to find out for some special material what is happening at 70K. So I think this is really some, some a real uh, problem uh, which was uh, buzzing the minds. And I, I, I looked through the models too, being a structural guy, and I must say it was all very high quality. It was very intriguing for about 18 months. We will find out what was happening. Um, just some of the other, on the other side of the applications, uh, there's been aspirations in Europe to try and uh, have also uh, a re-entry type of vehicles like the, uh, uh, the shuttle. Many years back, uh, there were plans to have on top of Ariane uh, something called the Hermes. Uh, this attaches subjects requiring a lot of monies. That program didn't go ahead at that time. Nevertheless, the hopes were been kept alive, and uh, more recently, something under the name Intermediate Experimental Vehicle, their intentions to try and understand more uh, intricacies of what happens if you want to uh, have uh, uh, reusable type of vehicles. And then, well, your one is talking up, you have temperature, to say you have parts exposed to 1600 degrees, uh, say centigrade up the front cone, and even higher ones, say the flaps at the back at about 1,900 degrees. And then we, there are, of course, other parts with MLIs, uh, say uh, intermediate temperature.
such as um, surface protective flexible insulation in that range. That gives you really a wealth type of materials and possibilities uh, one will be looking for. Then while you're looking up things which would have function in high temperatures at the same time, the mass penalty is not excessive. At the same time, you'd like to think you might be able to reuse them in a number of times. I think as we're sitting, uh, we're sitting in this very interesting uh, meeting here, I'm sure people 50 years from now, they might be looking up to aerospace planes going from here to Australia in a couple of hours. Uh, to achieve that, certainly there need to be going to be breakthroughs in propulsion, but also to have, uh, say, high temperature, lightweight materials is going to be an enabling element. And as we progress through, and uh, some improvements have been made in propulsion side, um, then also on the material side, uh, hopefully some of those elements will follow. I think it's fair to mention that there was an initiative to have uh, a vehicle to rescue uh, astronauts from the station under the name crew uh, CRV, um, where some of the elements in that the vehicle itself that were coming out of Europe, specifically coming out from Germany, there was a front cone coming out from the DLR and there was, say, a flap plus an actuator which was qualified even to higher than 2,000 degrees centigrade. At the end, for whatever reason, Perhaps also that was I mean, a very advanced vehicle, experimenting mainly advances in Europe. That specific vehicle, although it was built, uh, it was not flown. Some of the elements here, this is, was supposed to have been a cheap vehicle uh, launched by uh, a, a, a Russian missile of a submarine uh, to try basically to understand a bit more on the aerothermodynamics, say, say ballistic coefficients, I think it's fair to mention that uh, countries having nuclear deterrence, certainly uh, on, on the defense side, they have some good knowledge what is happening in that field. In the area of the more so civil applications, it's been more restricted uh, after now. What one is looking up is to have first class, say world class instrumentation, understanding of flows through or through bodies, and this is what this vehicle has been done. It's supposed to be a cheap vehicle uh, in the range of, 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 of about 30 million, whereas the instrumentation is coming from leading institutes. Again, this presentation is going to be uh, available to you. Anybody who would like to understand, take contacts with the community, who's providing which instruments from where. I think this is the purpose of this meeting here. We'll be very happy to, uh, me and my colleague, Mr. Henriksen, here the uh, meeting organizers, to get you in contact with all the relevant people. I think it's very important. And I think I applaud on uh, what has been the effort here to try and have this context. Just, uh, I'm going to go quickly through a number of areas where certainly materials are important. Um, and um, we're trying to take it up from there. Uh, the, the subject of the MEMS, I like to think that also later today in the presentation of Mr. Curley will address a number of things. I think to try and with one new view graph here to say uh, solve uh, issues of MEMS, it won't be justice. The important thing is the following. So far we've been designing big satellites in the class of uh, a few hundred, uh, 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 few hundred tons. Uh, the idea is if one, one is moving into MEMS type of technology uh, for quite limited mass, one could be having high performance. Of course, if you're building big telescopes and that's the dimensions, focal length, that's what you're having, that's one uh, area. But in a lot of other subjects, uh, MEMS uh, is appearing a solution, uh, a powerful solution. And the element is that you, you can go and buy down the shop a very powerful camera that an old man shaking his hand, still you remain focused. So there is a lot of terrestrial applications have been, um, been say, major breakthroughs just because the, the number of applications are very large. In space, we have the problem that uh, if one is looking up in very complex domains, how one is advancing where the actual the number of application users tends to be more restricted. So again there, um, I would say there is a lot of benefit to be gained. Uh, one is uh, addressing also people who have been advancing uh, in the area of MEMS, um, um, let's say worldwide. Certainly in the UK, people in kinetic, uh, uh, sorry in, in some way, um, the people also uh, apart from uh, civil application defense, They've been having, uh, say, the uh, edge on that uh, domain. And again, there is very important that the community 